Welcome back to Generals and Napoleon, episode 55, King George III of England. Before we begin, I'd like to remind all of our listeners about our Patreon page, where you can find bonus content and where you can support our podcast monetarily for as little as $10 per month. You can also follow us on Spotify, Facebook, and Instagram. Now, on with the show. For this episode, we welcome author and crime writer Mark Ellis of the Frank Merlin series. For those unfamiliar, his series of books focuses on crime and detective work in London during World War II. I recommend you check out some of his titles on Amazon and wherever books are sold, including Dead in the Water, A Death in Mayfair, The French Spy, In the Shadows of the Blitz, and The Embassy Murders. Mark is a keen historian, and I invited him on the show to talk about an interesting figure in history, King George III. Uh, very interesting monarch, one of my favorites. Indeed. Well, let's jump right in. Born in June 1738 in London. Can you tell us a bit about his parents, Frederick and Augusta? Uh, yeah, Frederick was the Prince of Wales, the um, first son of George II. And uh, he'd actually been brought up um, until I think he was about 20 um, in Hanover or in Germany. So when he arrived, he, um, he had a strong German accent. Augusta was uh, one of the many uh, German princes, princesses, or, uh, who ended up marrying uh, various royals throughout the 18th century. Um, and they actually were a very happy couple. Uh, Frederick did not get on with, very well with his father, George II. And to a certain extent, they set up an alternative court in Leicester House, which is in Leicester Square. In regards to George, he and his younger brother, Edward, were educated by private tutors. Do you think he had a pleasant upbringing? Well, pleasant in the sense uh, of uh, obviously living in luxury and having good <laughs> tutors and education provided to him. Uh, right. it, obviously, it was a little bit sad because his father died when he was 12. I think he was a, he was a very good student. He was a very keen and diligent student. Um, some of his homework actually still exists, um, which shows uh, you know, writing essays, very complicated essays. But he, he was a bright boy. Interesting. Uh, I just think it's amazing. You can still see the uh, the essays of King George III when he was in you know grammar school, essentially. Yeah. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily and distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. So in 1754, his father, Prince Frederick, dies suddenly from a lung injury at age 44 and George becomes heir apparent. It must have been an interesting experience for a teenager to accept, right? Because not only does his father die, but now he's on deck circle for king. Yeah, I get the sense that he was quite a mature 16-year-old and um, he knew that something big was coming his way. And he took it on bra bravely, I think. He, I think he was actually quite a brave man throughout his life. Um, he did have uh, a mentor in the, in the sh shape of the Earl of Bute, who was a Scottish lord. Uh, not very popular in England because he was Scottish, who were in those days regarded almost as still as foreigners. Mm -hmm. But he was his mentor for some time. Uh, in fact, and then he went on to become uh, one of his first prime ministers. Interesting. So I think uh, I think I think he uh, he was prepared and and but then continued to pre prepare himself for the job. Okay. So he takes the throne at age twenty two when um, uh, George the Second died in eighteen sixty. And he marries the following year to Charlotte, Princess of Mecklenburg Strelitz. Can you tell us a bit about her? Yeah, well, she was one of uh, the many um, uh, princesses. Uh, well, there, were, there were many, many royal princelings and uh, so on in Europe who uh, went on the marriage round with the various royals. Um, 
she was obviously quite young. I mean, they got married the day she arrived in London. So um, it was the, the, the exa exact form of a, an arranged marriage, but they were extremely happy. They were married for 50 years, had 15 children. Yeah. Um, and um, I think she was, she was a good influence on him. Mm -hmm. um, and she was, I got the impression she was a kind woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you said, it seems to be a happy marriage, uh, at least till King George's mental faculties start to decline. Um, and they had 15 kids. Was Were they both religious people or was George like a deeply religious man? No, I think they were both, both pretty religious. I'm, I'm, I'm not really aware that, that the marriage was no longer happy when he became ill. I mean, obviously it was more difficult. Stressful, yeah. Ill, yeah. But I think she continued to love him until her death, which was just before his. Mm -hmm. And yes, he was a religious man. When he became king, one of his first acts was to proclaim that basically everyone had to go to church on Sunday. Mm. Uh, and he also forbade uh, dancing on Sunday and added, um, introduced a new tax on beer. Mm. Uh, this, is like, this is like within a year or so of him becoming king. So in a sense, uh, some of these were not very popular. Uh, uh, was, new rules. That last one for sure, tax on beer probably was not hugely popular. <laughs> no, but he managed to overcome any initial, uh, I think it's probably the case that he was quite unpopular in his early years, but then gradually he developed to be quite a popular monarch. Well, yeah, I always... Occasional bouts when he wasn't popular. Yeah, I always but wonder... I think he, was, he was regarded highly uh, over his 50 years. So would you say he was more of a progressive monarch or more traditional? No, I wouldn't call him progressive. I mean, he was, uh, but he was aware of the fact that he was a constitutional monarch. Mm. And obviously he was one of the very first constitutional monarchs in the sense that uh, from the Glorious Revolution in 1688, uh, Parliament really was meant to be top dog over King, but yeah. Parliament could not pass laws without the King's approval. Yeah. Uh, so he was still very influential and, and certainly much more involved in government than, for example, Queen Elizabeth II or King Charles III are now. Right. Um, and, and he was, he always supported the Tories rather than the Whigs. The Whigs were a little bit more progressive than the Tories. Uh, so, um, yeah, he was, he, he certainly started out very traditional, okay. but he developed original ideas as I think he, his, his reign went on. Yeah. And you mentioned constitutional monarchy, just for those who don't know, you, the glorious revolution before that monarchs made all the rules and set all the, all the, I guess, laws in England. Right. And then constitutional yeah. monarchy. Yeah. Before the constitutional monarchy, the, the, the Kings and Queens were in charge. Although they were subject to Parliament in the sense that Parliament had to vote money for whatever they were want, they wanted to do, which obviously was a, quite a limitation. Mm -hmm. But yes, after the Glorious Revolution, uh, as I say, Parliament was was meant to be top dog, uh, but the King had an awful lot of influence. And then over the course of his monarchy, um, I mean, it, it developed the whole like, the whole way it worked developed more and more um, to the sense that. Um, ultimately, uh, when he started out as king, there was a prime minister in charge of uh, what happened in parliament. But the prime minister really, really wasn't regarded as the number one figure. But by the end of his reign, that was clearly established that the prime minister was the important figure in government and uh, with his cabinet. Indeed. Um, but in 1773, uh, the, the colonies in America become a hot spot for the British Empire. Colonists are angered over taxes to help pay for the cost of the French and Indian War. Notably, they dump British tea into the Boston Harbor. What do you think King George thought of these rebel Americans? Well, I think uh, when the war, when the problems began, which actually happened, you know, before 1773, Correct. yeah, it was the, the issues of the stamp tax and so on were coming. Uh, George would regard the colonists simply as other British people, mm -hmm. subjects of his. I don't think he really made a big differentiation. Um, and uh, there was a lot of money expended by the British government. And um, he thought it was completely natural that they should pay uh, for their taxes, mm -hmm. uh, pay taxes for, for, for the money that was expended on them. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, then they raised the issue of uh, no, no taxation without representation. Correct. But that, that's easier said than done since it, it took, took weeks to cross over the Atlantic. <laughs> wasn't really very efficient practical. right practical exactly yeah um and, and you know his ideas developed um as the as the war went on um and uh, but but fundamentally he thought these were, these were british people they should remain british people 
And if necessary, we, we i.e. Britain, should fight to keep the colonies as part of Britain. Yeah, and I just think it's interesting, this next part, is that, you know, instead of ratcheting down the tension with America, the British government passed the Intolerable Acts, which only made things worse. And yeah. King George is kind of depicted as a tyrant um, by the Americans. And in the pre-year wars, he acted, you know, as a constitutional monarch, exploiting the initiatives of his ministers. Was it more King George ratcheting, you know, increasing the tension, or was it Parliament, do you think? Uh, or was no, it? Both? I think it, 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 he, I mean, he had his views, but the government, the, the, the constitutional government, um, they made the decisions, mm -hmm. and the, 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 they were. I mean, there were there were people who were uh, taking the view that the colonists were right, and uh, people like the Earl, Earl of Chatham, William Pitt's father, Charles James Fox, uh, and a number of people in Britain did support uh, the, the the views of the colonists, mm -hmm. but the majority. Of, of the government throughout the period um, thought that the colonists should be should should play ball. Yeah, and of course we have to remember that um, I, I can't quote you an exact figure, but I think I think a, a very large number of the colonists wanted to stay as part of the, of yeah. the British Empire. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, it wasn't like five or ten percent; it was nearer forty to fifty percent. Yeah, yeah, loyalist regiments yeah. serving in the British Army. Yeah, there was a lot that wanted yeah. to. Stay. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, I think that that uh, that should be borne in mind. Mm -hmm. Well, the war, Revolutionary War, begins in earnest in seventeen seventy five, and the British had some initial success. But it turns into kind of a quagmire. The Americans, with French assistance, eventually win their independence uh, in 1781 with the surrender of British General Cornwallis. Why do you think the British were unsuccessful? They they done well maintain their colonies around the world. Why do you think this one gave them such a problem? Um, I think well, initially, I, I don't think the um, the British Army was necessarily badly led. I mean, obviously there were some bad commanders and there were some good commanders. But overall, I think there were good people involved. Uh, clearly, things became difficult when the French entered the war. Correct. Um, that, that, I think, was the, the real turning point. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was a long, long way away. And uh, there was a very determined uh, army that built up, was built up uh, under George Washington, mm -hmm. who was himself a great commander and leader. Mm -hmm. And um, in a way, I think it was inevitable that we would lose. If, if we didn't lose, you know, when I say we, I am British. But, <laughs> um, yeah, the country. We, we would right. lose, if we didn't lose then, it would, you know, it wouldn't be long before something else would happen because it was really a, a, such a, a big and powerful empire already, America was. Right. It's very rich, right. rich in produce and so on, even as just the 13 colonies. And uh, it was going to happen at some point. Yeah. And, uh, but it happened at this time, as I say, I think militarily, I think French involvement was one of the keys. And, uh, and, and but, but ultimately, George Washington was a very good leader. Agreed. Uh, but what people slightly forget is that once the war ended, trade with, between Britain and America started up very quickly again. Right. And in, in economic terms, you know, the, the government had been in deep debt at the start of the War of Independence due, due to other things like the Seven Years' War and things like that. Um, all of a sudden, the economic picture, once the Americans had gone, was rosier. Mm -hmm. Trade boomed. Uh, we didn't have the cost of maintaining the colonies. Mm -hmm. And so, so in a strange way, there was an, a, an improvement in the overall financial situation. <laughs> no, one yeah. ever, no one ever mentions that. But yeah. yeah, and going to war is not a cheap enterprise. It's very expensive. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, around this time, 1783, King George III starts to show signs of a, a mental decline. And, you know, people call him Mad King George, but there are several theories on this. What do you think the actual cause was? Well, again, um, I'm no medical expert. Right. All I can repeat is what I've read. There seems to be, for a long time, uh, people thought it was porphyria, porphyria, which is a, um, a rare blood disease, mm -hmm. which was responsible for, you know, he had a lot of odd symptoms, physical symptoms, and manic, manic periods as well. well those are the most famous ones. Um, I think latterly um, the view has developed that it wasn't porphyria, but it was manic depression. Mm. Um, I'm not quite sure how that explains necessarily the physical uh, symptoms that occurred, but apparently some people think it can. And um, I think I think that's the that's the 
main theory at the moment. Maybe there'll be another theory coming down the line. Um, I did see the excellent, there was an excellent film, a play and a film made called The Madness of King George III. Yep. Written by Alan Bennett, which um, had a wonderful performance by Nigel Hawthorne in the film. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that, that, to my mind, I'm afraid uh, my image of George III is much affected by my image of that film because he comes across as a very genuine sort of solid person right. with, with a lot of courage. Right. Well, yeah, just, um, you know, obviously it's hard to diagnose a, a symptom 200 years later of, of what would maybe yeah. might have been causing it. But uh, yeah. in a few years after that, though, you know, the French Revolution began and the Bourbon monarchy in France was eventually overthrown. It seems like there's never a dull moment in King George's life, right? I mean, why are the happenings in France of such importance to the British government? Well, obviously, it's pointing a dagger directly at the monarchy, isn't it? Right. Um, it's the French thing that they don't need a monarchy and they're going to set up a republic. Yeah. Well, why couldn't that happen in Britain? That, that's the thing that uh, obviously everyone was thinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it um, had a direct impact, I think, in the sense that with the, the, uh, I mentioned the two political parties that were out at the time, the Whigs and the Tories. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the Whigs were quite keen on reforming certain elements of Parliament to afford more people to vote. And those efforts were really sort of fell away then because they were almost frightened of, if you give more, to the, I think the view were, as expressed in one of the books about George III is, uh, you know, democracy is anarchy. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a good idea to give any more democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, um, there, there were personal relations too that, that had an impact. I mean, I, mean, I don't think, uh, King George and the Queen ever met the, their French equivalents, but the Queen was certainly a very close fr friend by virtue of correspondence mm -hmm. with Marie Antoinette. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was very shocking uh, when uh, she got beheaded and uh, Louis XVI got beheaded. Right. Um, and I think, um, obviously, there was also a threat that they would, there would be an invasion. Yeah. Uh, and there had been a, a threat, uh, I think, 10 years before, um, which had gone away. Um, and in due course, uh, not so much when during the French Revolution, but when Napoleon takes over, back then again comes the threats of invasion. Yep, yep. And, and you can see why, um, you know, other royals in Europe were frightened by this revolution where, you know, kings and queens are losing their heads and these, this yeah. re republic is threatening to topple. And, and you're right, there was. There was the Irish Rebellion, I think it was 1798, where France sent troops to Ireland to, to stir a rebellion. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I guess yeah. I can see why this might have made King George and Parliament a bit nervous. Yeah, and also there were there were practical considerations. I mean, you remember, meanwhile, Britain's empire was expanding in India, in in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. um, and other parts of the world, and that required ships to be ships in the line to be out there to protect our interests. Mm -hmm. uh, however, if we were going to get invaded, then we have, we'd have to pull some of those ships back. And then that, that might put other parts of the empire at risk. You know, there was a, there were a lot of complicated decisions that had to be made in conjunction with the French threat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's also interesting, though, like, you know, Napoleon comes to power in 1799. And after a couple of failed coalitions to topple France's new government, France and England actually signed a peace treaty in 1802 called the Treaty of Amiens. But it didn't. Yeah. It didn't last. It, I think it only lasted a year or two. Do you know why? Yeah. It, it didn't last. Well, I, I, I think there were lot, there were lots of little, there were lots of factors in terms of uh, continental European politics, but fundamentally, you you have to think to yourself the reason there was never going to be peace because Napoleon wanted to control the world, not just Europe. Really, mm -hmm. he wanted to he wanted to uh, co uh, conquer Britain because obviously we uh, and the Spanish. Um, and certain other countries were thwarting their own imperial ambitions around the world. Mm -hmm. So um, it was, and I'm not quite sure if it was really a quick case that he wanted to uh, you know, take over the running of Britain, but he wanted to stop us being able to thwart him from uh, making France the richest, most powerful country in the world. Mm -hmm. So um, it was inevitable, I think, that the, the peace, and, and uh, George actually never believed in a peace. He never thought that peace would, uh, would last. Work. He, for, for much of the time, he opposed the uh, peace negotiations. He accepted it. 
uh, when you know William Pitt and so on and, and various other politicians felt it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But uh, particularly since the executions of the uh, Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette, he, he thought France was a sinkhole, so to speak, <laughs> and could not, none of them could be trusted. Right, right. Well, um, by 1803, 1804, uh, Napoleon had arrayed a large, put basically put a large army on the coast of France for an invasion of England. And I found this quote very interesting. King George remarked, quote, we are here in daily expectation that Bonaparte will attempt his threatened invasion. Should his troops affect the landing, I shall certainly put myself at the head of mine and my other armed subjects to repel them, end quote, which I found very courageous for a constitutional monarch. As I said, I think he was a courageous man. He faced up to his illness courageously, and um, he, 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 his views. He, he, he fought very hard for his beliefs and views. Um, he um, uh, was a very, I think, quite more intellectual than people give him credit for. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you go into his, his writings, I mean, he was always writing letters to his prime ministers and so on, giving his views on the on the policies and so on. And, and um, I, I think it's not surprising to me that intellectual courage was matched by physical courage. Right. Of course, in, in reality, he, nothing ever happened, and he, he didn't have to face that. Mm -hmm. um, he, meanwhile, he had children who he had uh, I can't remember which which one of his sons. He, he had sons in, who were fighting on, on the continent and winning winning or losing battles. Mm -hmm. Not the Prince Regent, of course, because the Prince Regent was not up to much apart from wine, women, and song for much of his <laughs> life. <laughs> I think he, uh, you know, King George was, uh, you know, quite a rounded individual, um, and uh, I, I, I'm not surprised that he was brave. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, interesting, though, that Napoleon wrote several letters to King George offering peace, but I don't, they were mostly ignored, and I don't think Napoleon understood what a constitutional monarchy was. Did King George get involved at all in the handling of the day-to-day -day wars against Napoleon? Um, first of all, uh, I mean, he was always involved with his government and mm -hmm. giving his views to his government, mm -hmm. which for the latter part of his reign before he, the, 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 before he gave up being king, for two thirds of it anyway, from the, from the early 1780s to the early 1800s, his prime minister was William Pitt, mm -hmm. with whom he had a good relationship. He didn't agree without everything, um, with William Pitt, but, um, he also took a very keen interest in the running of the military. I mean, he was he, he, he was very interested in provisioning and arming and all those sorts of things. There are, there are many, many examples of him um, going to battles or going to visit army battalions and having immense knowledge about those things. So right. he would contribute his views about that too. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he seems like a very, you know, not a hands-on guy, but he certainly got involved, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, by 1810, though, despite being more popular on the home front at this time. He's nearly blind from cataracts and racked with all kinds of physical ailments. He's also lost uh, a couple of his children due to a variety of illnesses, correct? Two out of 15, I suppose, you know, in a way it's not bad, it's, given what life was like in those days, it's quite a, quite a good outcome. I mean, and there are, there are examples of other royals who lost, you know, had 10 children or more and lost them all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Marshal Lefebvre on the French side, I believe he had 12 children and 11 out of 12 died before adulthood. So yeah, it was yeah. a tough time. But um, testament to his inner strength, he carried on living for another 10 years after, you know, his physical ailments were really increasing. Um, yes. But by 1811, they say he was mostly insane from dementia and other problems and remain confined to Windsor Castle until his death in 1820. What were those last years like? Pretty miserable, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think he didn't really know an awful lot what was going on. He didn't even know. I mean, when his wife actually died, I think, a year, about a year before. And he didn't really, uh, at that point, he wasn't understanding anything. Mm -hmm. um, and he saw no one. And it was pretty pretty unpleasant way, way to go, I think. Did the Queen rule in his stead? Oh, no, 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 because in 1811, when he basically was committed, um, they introduced the Regency Act and um, his son effectively was king. That's right. Uh, That's right. And um, he was, he, he was, well, he was the regent and then eventually George III died and he became the king. He didn't last very long, mm -hmm. uh, but, um, and, you know, he was uh, uh, the Prince of Wales 
has a bad image and I think a lot of it is justified mm -hmm. but um, <laughs> um, you know he, he he ran up huge when when his father was alive he ran up huge huge debts I mean like the, the, the government had to bail him out of it. I mean he wasn't alone several other of the sons of George III did the same right uh, you know he did get married to, to Queen Caroline uh, but they had a terrible marriage and um, he basically also married one of his mistresses and he got it his, his life is a rackety story of its own. <laughs> and so I think I'll, think I'll let someone else discuss, yeah. discuss the reason. You, you can do a whole novel on his life for sure. Um, yeah, I'm sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But in towards, um, you know, King George III dies in 1820, what do you think his legacy was? Because it's, it's kind of interesting that he was on the throne when they lost the American colonies, but he was also on the throne when they defeated Napoleon. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, when he died, Britain was clearly established as the leading imperial power in the world. Yep. Uh, uh, we controlled, Britain controlled um, India mm -hmm. um, and various other colonies throughout the world, uh, bringing huge amounts of wealth into the country. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in a sense, that was probably more important than losing the American colonies, as I said earlier. It was probably inevitable that they were going to be lost mm -hmm. and it just happened under, on his watch but um he presided over the development of, of the uh, constitutional constitutional monarchy as we discussed mm -hmm. earlier and saw uh, whether intentionally or not and i think there was a part intention because he wanted to do the right thing he 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 oversaw an improvement in the way all of that worked such that uh when he died, okay, there was his son took over. Then briefly there was William the Fourth, but then we had Victoria, which was then the apogee of, of the British success throughout the world. Right, and it, she was working on a great foundation which was laid during his reign. Yeah, it's, um, it seems to me it provided a lot of stability. I mean, he was on the throne basically for sixty years. He did, and as I mentioned earlier, again he went through different waves of popularity. He was very popular for a while. He was not popular. And he was very popular and of course you know the, the that period is no is notorious for the um for the cartoons that used to be written the the drawn the terrible cartoons of the king and the mm -hmm. queen and his family uh, but that was that was in, in a way the, the early days of the free press you know right. they were allowed to do all of that they, they wanted to show pictures of the king throwing up in, in one corner of his palace <laughs> or whatever <laughs> they could do that uh, right so in a sense, that's another legacy. I mean, the development of democracy and free press mm -hmm. in a way that he allowed, that he allowed his government to allow, if I may put it that way. Yeah. Um, clearly, um, Britain became financially, generally much more uh, sound and, and successful. Mm -hmm. um, he also was very much involved in uh, the arts and, and um, the Royal Academy of Arts was founded, I think, in 1768 under his patronage. Um, he was a huge book collector. He built up a fantastic library, mm -hmm. which ultimately ended up in the hands uh, of the British Museum. He loved music. He had Handel and um, Mozart playing in the palace. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the Queen was particularly keen on, on music. Mm -hmm. uh, paintings, he was, uh, I think, one of his... Uh, favorite painters was someone who'd been born in America called Benjamin West. And yeah. I think he answered him. Then there was Herschel, who was both a musician and an astronomer who discovered the planet Uranus mm -hmm. and um, for, uh, uh, for the, the money for whose large telescope was provided by the king. Mm -hmm. um, sponsored lots and lots of different artists and uh, inventors. He was also very keen on uh, farming, mm -hmm. very knowledgeable about farming. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed, indeed, you know, for long periods of his life, he was called Farmer George. Yeah, he was. So, uh, I think he had a, a you know, he, he has a lot in his legacy. And I think you're right. I think, you know, his reign, he, he, like you said, he did a lot. And I think people are just too quick to dismiss him. Oh, it's Mad King George. But if you really dive into it, he had a lot yeah. of positives that came out of his reign. And he or his, or his armies beat Napoleon. Correct which was the major threat and we came out on top yep. and um, uh, I'm looking forward to see there's a new film coming by. Yeah, right? that's right. That's right. Yeah. Ridley Scott. I'm quite looking forward to seeing that. Yeah. The new trailer was really impressive, but uh, yeah. 
but yeah, no, I appreciate that, Mark. Um, for those of you who want to learn more about Mark and go on Amazon and look for his books, he's also on Twitter, right? What is your uh, Twitter handle, Mark? At, at Mark Ellis 15. Yeah. And uh, you can follow him there. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you coming on the show. This was fabulous. Thank That's you. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Really enjoyed it, John. Yeah. And very nice to meet you and your audience.